I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Luke, and chapter 24. Let me tell you what the problem is, and then we'll see if we solve it by the time we get through. The question comes down is this, must I repent to be saved? We automatically, and Dr. Hank Lindstrom says yes, I say yes, Dr. Stanford says yes, and we believe the Bible says yes, and um, the question comes down is, well, it all depends. What does it mean? And so then there's a discrepancy among theologians about what the word really does mean. Now, some believe that it means to turn from your sins. Repent, turn from your sins. So there's some that believe that. There's others that simply believe that it means a change of mind. Just change your mind. And you can change your mind about a lot of things. Uh, the wife of the man thinks that, uh, you know, the, the girl said, yes, I'll marry you. And uh, she changes her mind. That happens a lot. You can change your mind about anything. So there's those who believe that it just means that. But when it comes to salvation, if you have to turn from your sins, so it should be repent and believe, or repent and be saved, or repent and be born again, repent and whatever, for eternal life. So then that should go together. If you have to do this to get this, then it should be all together. Well, it's not always that way in the Bible. Because sometimes you find out in the Gospel of John, it just says believe, and you don't find the word repent anywhere mentioned. So people say, well, okay, well, you don't have to repent. So now there is a new school of thought that, yes, it does mean turn from your sin. And because it does mean turn from your sin, and they believe that salvation is by grace and grace alone without works, and that you don't have to turn from your sins to be saved, therefore repent does not have anything to do with salvation. It's just an extension of your life. So repent, they say, only means so you can have an extension of lifetime because God will kill you if you don't stop your sinning. So therefore, we want people to stop doing their bad so that they can live longer. Okay. So if that's true, then you never take the word repent and apply it to having eternal life, to be saved. So those two should always be separate. Okay. That means when you read the Bible, repent and have an eternal life should never be together because it means turn from sin, and we don't believe you have to stop your sin in order to be saved because we believe you're saved by grace without works. Are you confused yet? Good. Just a little bit maybe? This is going to be fun. I hope I can get through with this by the time it's time to eat. Because I do want to eat. I, I love that. But there are those who are clear on the gospel that you're only, all you have to do is trust Christ as your Savior and you're saved. So since they believe that the word repent means turn from your sin, then it doesn't apply to the Christian about getting salvation. It just applies to their life or to the lost man's life about the shortness of your life. In other words, if I, as a Christian, if I don't do right, I should repent of my sin so that God doesn't have to take my life. And that sounds, that sounds pretty good, okay? And that it also applies to the lost man. And so therefore, when God says that he commands all men everywhere to repent, it's just so that he could extend his physical life. So if he doesn't do as much bad, he can extend his life, he gets to live longer. Okay, let's say, for example, here's a man, and he's living in sin. He's just having himself a blast. Doing everything wrong he can think of. Really enjoying having a good time. And so somebody come along and said, Now, you know, you need to cut out this living like this. And if you'll stop it, God will let you live longer. My question would be, how much longer? How much more time am I going to get by giving up all of these things that I'm doing that is so bad? Because it might be worth it to just run the risk. It all depends on, well, how old am I? 
I mean, if I've only got a short time to live anyway, you know, what difference is it going to make? So it produces a few problems. And I hope you understand that I do have a little, you know, facetious ways about me and sarcasm at times. But overall, I'm a nice guy. But I don't like it when somebody mutilates the scriptures and says it says something that it does not say. So as you look here in the book of Luke in chapter 24, look in verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. This is a quote right out of the book that was written by an individual that is highly respected in Christian circles. And this is what he says. Luke 24, 47, emphasis added. He says, as should be obvious to anyone reading the Great Commission in Matthew, the Great Commission was primarily a charge to make disciples, not to evangelize. Then it says, if the account in Luke of the Great Commission is viewed narrowly as evangelistic, then one will likely conclude that repentance is a condition for everlasting life. However, that is not what the Lord says, nor is it what it means. In other words, the Great Commission that we read over in the book of Matthew chapter 28 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. What he's saying is that is not about evangelism. That's about discipleship. Because he says, and baptizing them, and then teaching them whatsoever I have commanded you. So the goal is not evangelism, it's discipleship. So therefore, the repentance doesn't mean what we think it means. So if you look there in verse 20, 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. If this is about fellowship, and you're to go into all the world and preach about fellowship, discipleship, referring to those that have already trusted Christ as saved. So it's saying the whole world is already saved. We're just going to go and teach them how to have fellowship with God. I don't think that's what Luke is talking about. I think when he makes the statement there, that Christ died and was buried and he rose again. Therefore, he says in verse 47, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in all the world. Well, beginning at Jerusalem. If that isn't about the gospel, then I don't know what is. But it does refer to the gospel because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The good news of why Christ died. And the reason you preach it is so that people can have their sins forgiven. But he makes a statement. He says this. What the repentant person gets, according to the Lord in Luke 47, is not everlasting life, but remission of sins. While many people equate these two, they are not at all the same. So he can have their sins forgiven, but it has nothing to do with having eternal life. And yet going to all the world and preach the gospel... So that people can believe it and have everlasting life. That's the purpose of it. And yet to take that and change it because they come out with a better definition of repent. It means turn from your sins. But knowing that a Christian can't, a lost man can't turn from his sins to be saved because that would put works for salvation. Then wherever we find the word repent must re be referring to the believer then. And about having fellowship. Or the extension of his life. And it has nothing to do with going to heaven. That is not the truth. That's why it's so important to understand this. Because this is really racking havoc with many of the people that went even to Florida Bible College years ago. That are now adopting this new philosophy. It is devastating. It is wicked. It is wrong. And it is not what the Bible says. 
We shouldn't have to go back into these simple verses and re-educate everybody as though it doesn't really mean that. Now, it says this, but it doesn't mean this. Repentance and remission of sin. See, I believe that repent means to change your mind. That could lead to a change of action, which many people believe. But when it comes to the gospel, I should change my mind and realize I can't save myself by my works. And the change of action is I trust Christ as my Savior. There's no problem. It doesn't mean that I have to turn from my sin and stop being a sinner so that God will save me. No. It is a change of mind. The Bible even talks about God who repented that he made man. God didn't turn from sin. He didn't have any sin. So it doesn't mean that he turned from sin. Now there are scriptures that talk about a person turning from sin. But to go to heaven, no. But a Christian should, with things in his life, give up things, stop things, cut out things that are sinful in his life. But there we're not talking about how to go to heaven. We're talking about because he is saved and he is going to heaven and a Christian should live right. God may not take him home before his time. God might just let you live. I know some people that lived up to their 90s and didn't live a good, clean life. And I know other people lived godly lives and they didn't make it to 60 or 70. So you know how, don't know how long you're going to live. So this is important. Also, there's a statement that was made. He said, if we compare this passage with Acts 2.38 and discuss next, he said, there is a reason to believe that the Lord wanted the disciples beginning at Jerusalem to call Jews and Gentiles to repent that they might have fellowship forgiveness. That's not what it's about. But that's what is being taught. And so, no, that is not the truth. I... Um, I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Acts. The book of Acts in chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Because they say that forgiveness of sins and repentance has nothing to do with receiving eternal life. And yet that was the last command that he gave to the disciples to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And they said, no, that's just for fellowship. No, it's not. You may have fellowship after you trusted the Lord, but the reason you preach the forgiveness of sins is because God has sent His Son to pay the penalty so that you can be forgiven. See, He couldn't forgive you until the payment was made. Now the payment's been made. Tell everybody their sin can be forgiven. They can go to heaven now because the payment for their sins has been made. So everybody is to repent. Change your mind and see that you can't save yourself by your works and you trust Christ and Him alone. That is a change of mind. That is repentance. They say, well, in the Gospel of John, you never find the word repent. Well, that's true. But you don't find the word Bible in the Bible either. And you don't find the word millennium in the Bible either. But it talks about the thousand-year reign, but it's there. You don't find the word rapture in the Bible, but the teaching is there. And just because you don't find the word repent mentioned in the Gospel of John, the meaning is they're all over the place. If a man is an unbeliever, he that believeth not, he that believeth not, he that believeth not, it's all the way through it. But he that believeth. So if you're an unbeliever and you believe, what did you do? You repented. You changed your mind. If you're an unbeliever and now you believe, what did you do? You changed your mind. You believed. It doesn't say you've got to stop all of your sins in order to qualify to be saved. No. That's works for salvation. So they say you, you never see those two words together, repent and have an eternal life or going to heaven when you die. Well, look what he says here in verse 43 of Acts chapter 10. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him. And that's what we usually tell anybody in order to be saved. Believeth in him, trust him, shall receive what? Remission of sin. Isn't that what they were supposed to go and preach? The forgiveness of sins? And it has to do with salvation. This right here, Cornelius was a Gentile. And he wanted to know how to be saved. And if you look there in chapter 11, 
Look in verse 14, where he rehearses this situation about what had happened. And he says in verse 14, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall have fellowship with God? No, it ain't talking about fellowship. It's about how you can be saved. And so when he went there and he preached, they heard, they believed, and they were saved. And he's talking about the remission of sins, which was the command to go into all the world and preach that. And they say, well, you don't find repent. And so they change the thing and say, hey, forgiveness of sins uh, has nothing to do with going to heaven. Somebody's lying. That's, that's not the truth. And these are individuals that's got all kind of degrees after their name. Gone to the best colleges and universities and cemeteries, uh, seminaries. But they don't get it. The Word of God is clear and it's simple. All that you have to do to go to heaven is if you'll believe that when Christ died, He died for you and, and you can have eternal life. So God has commanded every man everywhere to repent. If it only meant that you repent and turn from your sins so that you can have more time to live. Why? Everybody's going to die anyway. You just don't know when. So I got me a, I quit all my sins. <laughs> I lived another week. You don't know how much time you're going to have. Yes, God can cut your life short. You don't know how much time you're going to have. And as a chastening, God may take your life. Yes, I do believe that a child of God should live a godly, holy life. And yes, I believe that God can chasten him while he's here. But God may not take him home. God may let him live and suffer and put him on a shelf and not use him and waste his life. Why do you think the Bible talks about if a man gains the whole world and loses his own soul and loses his life? It means that you can live and waste your life. So your living and wasting your life is a part of the chastisement. It's not always death. And to think that that's what it's referring to, I believe, is error in teaching. In Acts chapter 11 and verse 18, you notice there in verse 18, it makes this statement. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. That word life is talking about eternal life. But the word repentance, they say, now this doesn't refer to having eternal life. Well, they're just talking about somebody just got saved. Up in verse 14, I just read that to you. And look in verse 17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. What did you get when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Eternal life. So it says that they got the eternal life. But how did they get this eternal life? Repentance unto life. They repented. They changed their mind and trusted Christ as their Savior. But they, they, you never find that in the same verse. So they take this very verse and take the word repent and give it the meaning of turning from your sins. And when they give the meaning turning from your sins, well, then they got to change this word, having life, to refer to just your physical life. Now these people were able to enjoy the physical life. Fellowship with God. Well, that may be true, but that's not what this verse is saying. You see, they gave a new definition to the word repent and then go back and then mutilate the Scriptures. And now you've got to change everything because they can't mean that then. See, either a man is saved by grace or he's saved by his works. So when you say that the word repent means to turn from your sins, but you believe a man is really saved by grace, then you can't put these two things together because they contradict each other. So then this means this is talking about just your physical life. And this has nothing to do with getting to heaven because this is just by grace. Yes, you're saved by grace, but repent is to change your mind in order to believe. If I am an unbeliever and I believe, I have repented. I've changed my mind. If I don't find that word mentioned in the whole Gospel of John, the meaning is still there. Whether I like it or not. Because I went from unbelief to belief. Metaneo, metanoia, repent, change your mind, reconsider, think differently. So, it's here and it's clear. Let me um, read this to you. <coughs> this is what they said. If we compare this passage 
there is a reason to believe that the Lord wanted the disciples and called the Jews and the Gentiles to repent that they might have fellowship forgiveness. This is a part of discipleship message, not an evangelistic one. This verse in no way contradicts John 3.16. They're not talking about the same subject. Well, if John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, and they preached the gospel here to Cornelius and his household, and they believed it, and they were saved, and the Bible says they were granted repentance unto life. They changed their mind, they believe, and they're saved the same way. Sounds simple to me. Just hold your place right there, but look over there in chapter 15. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. And look in verse 9. Excuse me, in verse 7. Acts 15, verse 7 says, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Peter says they heard the gospel through my mouth and they believed. So when you go there to chapter 10 and chapter 11, is he talking about the gospel and being saved? Yes. How can they say it doesn't talk about that? Something's missing. All because you start changing a word, and then you've got to go back and mutilate those scriptures. Didn't know what else he says. He says in verse 9, And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. It's not talking about, now we can have fellowship with God. Because you stopped your sins. That's not the issue. It's not what it's talking about. But notice what it says in verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall have fellowship just like they do. No, we shall be saved even as they. So this is why it's important to study the Bible and know what God says because there's a lot of different philosophies out there. And they're all designed, when it's designed by man, it'll cause you to lose confidence in what God really does say. Like there's some people that believe that, you know, God has already chosen who he wants to go to heaven. And only those are going to go to heaven because that's all he chose. So if that's all he chose, then Christ didn't have to die for everybody. He just had to die for those that he chose to be saved. So that you can't say that God so loved the world because God doesn't love the world. He only loves those he's going to save. What preacher has the gall to stand up and tell people, oh, there's some, some of y'all, God doesn't love some of you. Christ didn't die for all of you. Some of y'all can't be saved because God didn't love you enough to save you. But he's not a respecter of persons. Well, wait a minute. Why didn't he put me in that bunch that goes to heaven? You see, it's, it's error in their teaching. R.C. Sproul, who comes on right before I do every Sunday morning, that's what he preaches. That's what he preaches. I can't go on the radio and tell him, look, I want you to listen to me real close now. Uh, God doesn't love all of you. God doesn't love some of you. And he doesn't love you for any particular reason. He just chose to save you from the foundations of the world because, well, we don't know what it is, but there was just something about you. And then later on, God says in his word, he's not a respecter of persons. Then I want to know, what did you use to discern why this person should go to heaven and not this person? Why did you choose this one and not choose this one? You see, that's error in teaching. And everybody can say, oh, how wonderful. Oh, he's so good. No, he's not. No, it's not. You say, you're going to make people mad. So be it. It's not because I want to. But either I take and put this above every man, even me. This is more important. This book. If a person can scripturally show me where I teach it's wrong, you have the right to come to see me. Just chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. But also come understanding this. I probably have already read the chapter and the verse. I know above it and I know below it. And most of it I can quote it. It's not bragging, it's just the tracks. I teach this all the time. I've been doing it for 50 years. So there's a little bit about this thing that I know. When somebody says something, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't jive. That doesn't go with the book. And then I have to say something. Also, they say there in Acts chapter 2, that they were not being saved. That was for fellowship. 
Acts chapter 2, very quickly, look at this. I want you to see this. <coughs> it said that Acts chapter 2 is not teaching that repentance and baptism are necessary a condition for everlasting life. It is teaching that for the new Jewish believers who had personally participated in the death of Jesus, they must repent and be baptized to have fellowship, forgiveness, and to receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. Since when do you have to be baptized in water to get the Holy Spirit when Jesus has already said that he that believeth on him would receive the Holy Spirit? And then he said this is not talking about how to be saved. So if that's not the reason, why would you have there in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Down in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It's talking about salvation. But when you change the word, you change the context of the whole point of Scripture, and you've got to give it another meaning, meaning now. And this is being propagated very wide, very strongly, among free grace individuals, that this is the new philosophy. It's a new vision of what repent means. It's heresy. It's not what the book says. It's changing what the Bible says. And if I make a few enemies along the way, then so be it. Take your Bible. I want you to look at this. Look in Romans in chapter 2. The book of Romans in chapter 2. There's a verse here in Romans chapter 2 that has the word repent in it. And it's mentioned there in verse 4. So Romans chapter 2 verse 4. Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But they say this repentance is not talking about heaven and hell or going to heaven. It's only talking about so that you will realize that you ought to not do these bad things and God won't have to take you, take your life. Regardless of how you live, sooner or later, you're going to die. And you don't know whether or not because of, yes, because some people they've done this and they die early and they may be alcohol and they ruin their liver and, and somebody else smoked and they get emphysema. And, and so, so sometime when we abuse the body, you might die early. So you can confess the sin and stop your drinking, stop your smoking, but I can guarantee you, it doesn't necessarily heal the body. It can still take your life. My mother stopped her smoking about 20 years before it finally took her. But she had already got the emphysema, already had this damage done. My sister came to me one day. I was preaching in a little old white church, a little old Methodist church. And after I got through, I went back to the back, and I was shaking hands with people. And my sister Lizzie, she came up, and she says, Yankee? I said, yeah. She says, I quit. I quit drinking. Okay. When did you quit, Liz? Now. And as I know of, she never took another drop for almost 15, 20 years. Just. She had her own liquor still. She drank until she could, <laughs> she could sink this building. But she drank. But even though she quit, she still had liver problems. She had health problems. And it could have contributed to her dying early. But you see, when you say that, okay, here you are and you're all these wicked people and you do all these wicked things, if you will turn from your sins, you'll buy you a little time. It may be true. But you don't take that and apply it to the Word of God in the wrong spot. And say that this is what repent means when you come to salvation. It's not required. So now they're saying nobody has to repent. Repent has nothing to do with salvation. It only has to do with temporary life. That isn't true. It's like telling a man that he doesn't have to repent. You don't have to change your mind. Well, I think I can get there by my good works. Okay, don't repent. 
I believe you get there by uh, being water baptized and keeping the Ten Commandments. No, he has to change his mind. That's not true. See, if you don't use the word, you still have to use the meaning. They have to understand it. You still got to understand you cannot save yourself by what you do. So therefore you are to repent. That's why the Bible says you go into all the world and preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins. They do go together. And they say, no, they don't. Yes, they do. So here in the book of Romans, they said, this is just talking. Let me just read it to you just the way he had it wrote. The idea of repentance here, of course, refers to the need the, the need the moralist has to turn away from his own sin to avoid the wrath that God exercises upon or against such things. The issue here is temporal wrath, not eternal condemnation. So, as we read here about the wrath of God, the wrath of God, okay, you'll notice when he says there in verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's it, talk about the temporary wrath that you go through in life. Because you made God mad and zap. In the book of Romans in chapter 1, it makes a statement, verse 16. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then he says, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is it written, the just shall live by faith, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and blah, 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 blah. Men are doing these bad things. What do they need? Stop doing those bad things? No. They need to be saved. Because, you see, you can't stop all these bad things that you do. You have a sinful nature. Like I said before, you don't tell a dog, Dog, you stop acting like a dog and I'll make you a chicken. How long would it take? So here in verse 17 talks about the wrath of God and the righteousness of God in verse 17 and 18. It's the same thing that you find there mentioned in verse 5 of chapter 2. But chapter 1 is talking about the gospel. In verse 16, the gospel, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. And they say, well, we're not talking about that. This is just talking about how you live your life in temporal. And... No, you've got to mutilate it. Take your Bible and look in the book of um, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And notice what he says here in verse, well, where's a good place to start? It's also good. Look in verse 5. Verse 5, And hope maketh not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. God didn't tell them to stop your sins. Christ died for them. Look in verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for a for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, is that about salvation? Christ died for us. We were sinful, wicked, we were without strength, we couldn't save ourselves. And God displayed his love toward us and sent his son. He died for our sins. Is that about having eternal life and going to heaven? Sure looks like it to me. But look at the very next verse. In the next verse, he says, in verse 9, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Because I'm justified, I am saved from wrath. This goes together. This is a context. And it's not because I turned from my sin. It's because he died for my sins. There's a difference. In my mind, it's, it's so clear. But I can see where somebody could get messed up, I guess. But it's important to me because I just don't want people to go to hell. I believe the Great Commission, and they said, well, it's not evangelistic. It was just to get disciples. Well, you've got to get them saved before you can disciple them. Just to go around in the world and try to get people to live like a Christian. Yeah, if they die, they go to hell. 
And if I tried to get the lost people to stop their sins, well, that, that's good. But when they die, they still go to hell. No, there's something that's even better. One more that I want to give to you before I close here on this subject. Take your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Peter. <coughs> First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter, chapter two. Second Peter, chapter two tells us a lot about some false teachers, false teachers, false teachers. Talks about them judgment that came upon the earth. Talks about Noah. Talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. Talk about the angels. How that God judged these people. Well, God had promised what he was going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah before it happened. And, and it happened, just like he said. He told Noah, build a boat. And um, he did. And the flood came. Because God promised, and it happened, just like he said. Well, then there's this teaching about Jesus is going to come back again. Well, that's the second coming of Christ. He's supposed to come. It was promised. And just like God kept His promises on these other things, God's going to keep His promise on the other. He is going to come back. So He makes a statement over here, saying, I want to stir up your mind now in chapter 3, where He says, I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. One of the things that I've been trying to do uh, with new letters that I've sent out recently is to cause people to remember what we have done so that we can do greater things in the future. Why do people take pictures? What do you need a picture for? Because when you get older like I am, you can look back. Oh, now I remember. That's what we used to look like. Oh, this is where we were. You know, a vacationer is a person who travels 3,000 miles and takes their picture in front of a car. We were here. You've all done it. You know that. Telling everybody, don't take my picture. Don't take my picture. <laughs> Don't take my picture. Nobody likes to have their picture taken, I know. But here, notice what he says in verse 2. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where's the promise of his coming? You see, he promised these other things, and they happen, and that should refresh our memory a little bit. God makes promises and God keeps promises. But he says, he said he's coming back. Well, where is he? <laughs> they ought to be where we are 2,000 years later instead of right there. But he said in verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, by the word of God. The heavens were of old, the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, was overflowed through water and it perished. Now, the word perish Apollumi, is given to show, according to this new teaching, this is just a temporal judgment, because it just is temporary. The people that died, I assure you, it was permanent. It was permanent. Dead is dead. It's like this. I know somebody that got saved. Great. But then I heard somebody else say, I know a man that was really saved. And then I heard another man talk about, he was gloriously saved. So you can be saved, really saved, gloriously saved. I believe if you're saved, you're saved. Now, here's a man who's dead. Now this man over here, now he's really dead. This man over here, He's gloriously dead. Like an atheist laying in the casket, all dressed up and nowhere to go. But this is what was said when it comes to... The, they would simply mean that repentant Gentiles, turn from their sin, are people to whom God would bring the message of eternal life so that they could simply believe in Jesus and be born again. So the lost people are to turn from their sins. And if they do, then God is obligated to get the gospel to them. 
But we're not saying you've got to turn from your sin to be saved. <sighs> and this is what they said. The most natural way to read this verse is that John's baptism of repentance was part of a ministry whose aim was to get people to believe in Jesus for eternal life. This verse is not at all saying that one must repent to be born again. See, they're saying you don't have to repent to be born again. And yet, the Bible says over and over and over again, you must repent. God commanded every man everywhere to repent. The book of, uh, of Acts in chapter 17. Now, here's the thing. In this scripture we're just reading, this is what they do to explain it. The perishing, clearly the perishing, mentioned in verse 6, is not eternal condemnation. Peter is speaking of physical death, not eternal condemnation in verse 6. If the perishing in verse 6 is physical death, then isn't it highly possible that it also refers to physical death in verse 9? Just three verses later. If verse 9 refers to physical death as well, then the point Peter is making is not about heaven and hell, but about life and death. So God is not concerned here with their eternal destination, but only that they turn from their sins so they can extend their life. Now, I read it just like it's in the book. So all God was interested in is trying to get them to extend their life. I'll let you live a little longer if you just stop your sinning. Hmm. But when God takes her life, isn't that permanent? It's not temporary. But you mean they, they could have got another five years. Maybe they could have got another ten years. And then you go to hell. You just don't get to go to hell as early. But you're still going to go. Well, look there in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. Now, if it means just, does, He's not willing that any should die physically. We've got a problem. It don't make any sense. God's not willing that anybody should physically die. And that's why God's waiting and waiting and waiting. Well, the longer He waits, the more people die. Ain't it? I mean, if he came 2,000 years ago, there wouldn't have been this many people lived that would have died. I mean, I can figure this out. And I'm not that bright. Well, my mama calls me son. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Because they were doubting whether or not, is Jesus going to come or not? He promised, well, he, he promised these other things too, and it happened just like he said. And he says that the, uh, the world's going to be destroyed by fire. And it was. I mean, by uh, the flood. And it was. Now he says it's been in reserve and it's going to be destroyed by fire the next time. Well, that's true. But why does God wait? He says, God is not willing that any should perish. I think the word perish is talking about he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. You ever heard of John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, same word, but have everlasting life. Why can it mean there it's okay? But here, well, it's not talking about that. And the reason is because, you see, it has the, uh, the word repent in there. And repent means to turn from sin, see, and so they know that can't be the truth, so you've got to change the whole meaning of the context. You know what I like to do? Slap her jaws. Where do they get the authority to do, to, to mutilate God's word? And that there's people that do it. And I feel like uh, I need to make it, this is a, something that really caught my eye. This is what he said. He said the conclusion. Repentance is one of the most misunderstood words in the Bible. But once we grasp what it means, it is a wonderful concept. God has made a way for the person who is on the path of death to escape. It is called repentance. Anyone, believer or unbeliever, who continues down the path of rebellion against God is inviting premature death. Sooner or later, God will take his life. Yeah? Repentance is a way to escape. You mean if I turn from my sins, I won't die? This 
physical death. If I just stop all my sinning, or I guess the, the big stuff. <laughs> Perhaps repentance is one of the most misunderstood words. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't until they got a hold of it. Look up here. I'm not trying to even make fun of what, because it's, 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 it's not, it's a serious thing. And you are in the future, you're going to be hearing about it because it's coming. Coming down the pike, it's been written in articles and so forth. This hand represents you and me. The wall represents sin, we all have sin on us. God loves us, hates our sin. But you see, for us to pay for sin is eternal separation from God in hell. Since we've all sinned, we're all condemned. We're all in the same boat. Now, to go to heaven, we have to be perfect as righteous as God. And none of us are perfect. None of us are righteous. And so the Bible says you cannot save yourself from hell. To tell people, look, why don't you just stop some of your sinning so you, you can extend your life a little longer? Okay, but where am I still going to go? Well, you're still going to go to hell, but you won't get there soon. Huh. So, will it matter if you got another six months out of it? Six days out of it? How much time will you get out of it? Nobody knows. Yet, it is important, and I'll preach that at another time, because, yes, there is some truth, but it applies to the believer and the believer only. So, God says that you can't save yourself. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord, God in the flesh. He came into the world because He loves us. He hates what we do wrong, because what we do wrong, it separates us from God. So, you can't have fellowship with Christ until you are saved, born into His family. Fellowship is with God's people. So Christ took the sin, paid for it on the cross, came back from the dead and said, If we would believe, He did it for us. He would give us as a free gift everlasting life. See, everybody born in the world believes that salvation is by man, saving themselves by how you live. God says you must repent, change your mind. You cannot save yourself by your good works. You don't go to church to go to heaven. You don't give money to go to heaven. You don't pray to go to heaven. Salvation is free. It's the gift of God. You simply accept what Christ did for you. And when you believe that He did it for you, He gives to you as a free gift everlasting life. So you repented. You changed your mind and trusted Christ as your Savior. God gives you eternal life. You go to heaven because you're forgiven of all of your sins. Simple, not hard, not complicated. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're watching by internet or here in the auditorium, I want you to understand God loves the whole world. When Christ died, He died for everybody. And when He says, Whosoever will, He means you. So if you will right now, will you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Will you trust Him to take you to heaven when you die? If you've never done it before, I'm not going to have you forward. I'm going to embarrass you. You don't even have to raise your hand, but I just ask people to do it just so that I'll know if I made sense to them. And I like to know, and I like to have prayer for you. But I'm not going to trick you or pin you against the wall afterwards. I just want to know, will you trust Christ as your Savior? If you've already done it, you don't have to do it again. But in the quietness of this moment, with heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone that all say, yes, I will trust Christ as my Savior. I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. I realize I cannot earn it. I can't work for it. That it's a gift. That it's free. And I will trust Christ as my Savior. Would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down? Yes, God bless you. Anyone else? Just slip it up. Put it right back down. Anyone else? Make sure you trust that Christ as your Savior. It's so important. There is no other way. You cannot earn it. Our Father, we thank you so much for this time together. And bless those that are watching by internet. And Father, for the individual that indicated by an uplifted hand that they would trust your Savior. By doing so, they become your child, your child forever. You said in your word, you never cast them out, never lose them. Because eternal life is free. It is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. We ask now your blessings upon the, the fellowship. Yes, we will enjoy and Father, we thank you for the food and for those that worked so hard and prepared it.